What's up, everybody? This is Marnik van der Broek, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Stand Up Talk. And again, I have a very special guest. And you can take, you always say a special guest, but that's what I do. If I invite you to the podcast, I am really convinced that you have something to bring to the table. And the following man, which I'm going to introduce in a second, I can already see him, uh, is, is someone I saw a while back when I was hosting an event. And he was talking about leadership, about culture, about teamwork. And he was active and still is active in the baseball world. He even won a world championship with the Dutch national team. And I saw him talking and I noticed myself getting really excited. He was speaking and my heart rate was pumping. And I was like, oh my God, this man is really triggering something in me. I was so motivated after his 20, 30 minute talk that afterwards I thought I need to connect with this man. I need to have him on the podcast. And that's what I did. And I want to pick his brain on that topic, leadership, team culture, peak performance, excellence, linking the sport to the business. So I'm super excited for this. And without further ado, because he's probably thinking, Marnik, introduce me all, introduce me already. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about no one else and give him a big round of applause, Brian Farley. Hey, Marnik, great to be here. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, man. There you go. I think I introduced you during the conference because you were known back in the day for your fastball. As, is it a bullet? Is it a train? No, it's Brian Farley. I don't know if you still remember that. I do actually, and that was quite a compliment. Yeah, I was. I was really. Uh, uh, I really had to laugh uh, at that. Um, obviously, that uh, velocity as as an introduction is always uh, is always very interesting to set to set you up in terms of the expectations. So you're like, okay, I got I got to get it going here, full steam ahead, man. Let's get some speed going here. It's great. Oh, actually, I also remember that you said because. I'm not, I don't know a lot about baseball, but that you said back in the day, it was a fastball, but now as everything, it evolves. And now the speed was X and now it multiplied by, I don't know how much. True. And back when I played, I was in the mid eighties and stuff. I mean, if you hit 90 miles an hour, which is what, 145, um, yeah. that was, that was a, a big number and something that, you know, most people were really take notice of, but 90 miles an hour was a big deal. Yeah. And now uh, with the, the advances in, in uh, you know, training and, and uh, uh, just overall techniques and being able to slow motion camera analysis of, of people's uh, mechanics, now they've been able to increase this to where the average speed now is about 92 to 95 miles an hour. So a big jump. That's the average. I mean, when I was talking about an outlier at 90 something, so uh, and there's guys throwing above a hundred miles an hour. Um, and, and that used to be like also like uh, one and a couple million, but now you're seeing more and more guys reaching that kind of velocity. It's pretty amazing. All right. So that, that's a cool thing about this, about, human beings about our society about sport is as the fastball evolved everything is evolving and and also what we're going to talk about with the leadership and the culture we knew nothing back in the day and then so many years later if you see how that field evolved uh we know so much about people how to work with them and that's why we're only going to tap we're not just going to talk about fastballs but just for people that don't know you now they they should know you um not going too deep in it but Correct me if I'm wrong. It's baseball. You started your career in the U.S. because you were originally from the U.S. Uh, baseball has been your whole life. If I, you have a Wikipedia page, page of enormous one, baseball okay. has been all, Yeah, you don't know. Uh, I don't know if everything's true, so I'm checking right now. You have been in baseball all your life, um, have, been, have been working with the, with the pros, playing yourself, then starting in coaching. You came to the Netherlands. You became, and that's – course not your only achievement but that's the big one definitely for for our regions because we're not baseball countries uh, and with the netherlands winning the world cup in 2011 being the coach of the year uh getting the coach of the year award and marrying your wife in or proposing in the stadium is that also right or is that a rumor uh, not the proposal but definitely the marriage was on the baseball field yeah yeah we uh we have a history there of obviously both my wife was in softball at the highest levels as well so yeah um, and at the time, we were both coaching uh, at at, uh, at the same club in uh, Busum, ACV. Mm. She was the softball coach; I was the baseball coach. So we thought that was appropriate to actually give back to the uh, to the club by uh, allowing them to attend our way. <laughs> <laughs> that is so. Baseball is truly the life sports, and what I really like uh, is you have been in sports most of your life. And now you're a 
a speaker, a coach, a consultant. We see you at conferences. I saw you at conferences. You're, you're, you're helping business leaders with their, with their teams, with what they're doing. How did you make, because it's a really hard one. You see a lot of people in sports that have a very high professional level like you. And then afterwards, they're like, what do I do now? And you made that transition very smoothly. So how did you do that? And how did you go from the coaching to the business side of things? Yeah, um, I, uh, well, you know, just in, in, in fact, uh, I really haven't ever exited coaching. I'm just coaching at a different uh, level and with a, obviously a different audience in, a, in a different industries. Um, but originally, um, how I made that transition, I, I, uh, I think I've I <laughs> lost my track here. Going for a back into the past, you're like, oh my God, Marty, you're talking about ages ago. <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, one of the things that really helped me make that transition is obviously when I, when I came here, I, I couldn't sustain myself just with baseball. It just wasn't uh, able to uh, yeah. uh, fund, you know, get enough revenue through the game itself because it was still very much part-time and, and amateur level. Uh, it was only later that we were able to get a full-time job within the, uh, within the, the Dutch Federation for me. So in order to stay in Holland, in order to exist here, I had to get a job like everybody else. And uh, I, I got really fortunate. And then I, I ended up getting a job in the alcohol drinks industry, which is another story in itself, a really nice story that uh, allowed me to get into uh, working uh, in, in businesses and understanding the demands that businesses have with KPIs and, and, and hitting your figures and hitting your numbers on and, and the pressures that go with that. And so I had 15 years in the alcohol drink industry with Anheuser-Busch and then in Diageo, um, which in sales and marketing, which really allowed me to understand the, uh, the dilemmas and the pressures that happen within the working environment. So it wasn't that big a transition for me later on to take those, that knowledge that I had working in those industries and then combine it with the sport background mm -hmm. to really try to combine the two and get some interesting angles on on how you can translate some of the things that we experience in sports into the business world, because I had kind of experience at both levels. Yeah. And, and do you see like a difference in, because there's a lot of talk about leadership. It's I have did interviews before leadership. If you look at Google, you have 200 million and more results on what probably leadership is. And a lot of people, if you look at the Olympics, if you look at the, the, the big tournaments, people look at sports as wow, that is where, people go beyond themselves and peak performance. And then you have the business side of things you're over managing your team and making sure nobody burns out. What is for you looking at both worlds, the definition of, of, of true leadership? Is it different in sport and business or is it just one general idea of what good leadership is? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I think uh, to me, good leadership is, is, um, is synonymous regardless of what industry you're in and where you're at. I mean, obviously with sports, you're usually in a spotlight on television or there's a lot of, of uh, focus through fans and so forth that you don't have in an industry where you have people following you as a fan or, you know, coming to all your uh, board meetings, you know, and lining up outside. I mean, there's, a, there's an external element there that really takes place that adds a new dimension of pressure and expectation. Uh, that you don't have in, uh, in the office every day. Um, but the demands on you personally within the team and to function within the team and to be there for the team are the same. They're very similar uh, conceptually. So I think good leadership to me is the ability to, to, to gauge the, the talent that you have and then to develop that talent into skill um, and, and helping people reach their full potential because once that skill is there and they can consistently perform at a certain level, then, then we can start to look at achievements. Mm -hmm. So it's about really, you're, you're really, as a leader, you're in service of your people uh, and you're trying to get the most out of your people. And that requires certain qualities of a leader that allow you to understand that person. And every person is unique, you know, and we can talk forever about the, 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 the uniqueness of individuals and how I think a great quality of a leader is how you take the diverse qualities of your team and unify them behind a collective ambition. Yeah. So how do I get a bunch of diverse people with different interests and passions and so forth, and then unify them behind a common passion that they all desire to achieve or to create. And that's to me, the key of a leader is to be unif unification of diversity towards a collective ambition. That's, 
I was thinking like, how do we sum that all up? And then you just end it with that. And it, I think that's, that's truly, that's truly the simple explanation and what it's all about. Some simple mean that that's, there's nothing more to it. I think, like you said, having people bringing them the best of them, even if they don't see it themselves, bring them to the ex excellence, combining it with others behind a common goal. And everybody's like, wow, I didn't know we can do this. Right. Right. And that's really when we look back at our life, those are the, those are the moments where we really uh, look back with such fondness mm -hmm. is those places where we didn't, we had the uncertainty, you know, we, we didn't know we were struggling. Uh, we were uncertain. We were struggling. We, we were dealing with a lot of change, a lot of adversity. We had to adapt uh, and we did it. And wow, you know, and that's when you get that moment where you, you've just experienced this enormous growth within yourself and this enormous increase in, in your own, character and versatility and agility whatever those things are that's happened that's made you grow yeah. um you now have that experience that that kind of anchors you in the future when those experiences come up again yeah and that's what we look back on is that you know it, it, there's a great expression that says uh success is based on uh good judgment good judgments based on experience and experience is based on bad judgment so it's the ability to go out there and try and to fail, but learning from those failures, getting back up and saying, okay, what went wrong? How'd that happen? Because I stay engaged with the destination of what it is I want to achieve. You know, that, that desired outcome remains, remains something that pulls me uh, and, and keeps me going when I've had numerous failures in the attempt to get there. So how do I keep that juice flowing? You know, that's, that's the interesting part of it. And how do I keep all those people doing the same thing that's the theory is great the practical side is is very challenging yeah i can i can imagine i can imagine and there's two things i want to touch upon on what you just said one maybe a, a short side jump but i know this is really a hot topic because it pops up on so many conferences that that deal with this topic you said about the failure it's a, it's a little side jump i want to make but i really want to get your perspective on it it's there's so much talk about failure these days within business within sports and for me personally, I'm not saying that's the case, but for me personally, it has become this fail fast, fail, fail is great. You have to fail to get to the success, fail. And some people are interpreting it as failure is good. Let's mm. just fail. But what is good failing for you? Because now it, we, the, the, we went to the other side and now just everybody's failing for the sake of failing. But I don't think that's it unless you correct me. No, you're right. I mean, obviously, this, we're not failing in order to fail. We're failing in order to succeed. So I think maybe we need to redefine what, what failure is for many people, because that's something that I think, not only in the definition of failure, but in the definition of many things, where things go wrong is because we, we tend to um, have assumptions or perceptions of what these things are. Mm -hmm. And we all tend to uh, assume that the other person is, is, is understanding the word the same way we do, and, and it's not the case. So we all have this different way of evaluating and, and interpreting uh, words and uh, situations. So, I mean, for me, failure is two things. It's not learning from the mistakes of my attempt in the first place. So if I do try something and I, and I don't succeed, what happened and really get into an in-depth analysis of, okay, what, what was it that, that went wrong at that time? And how do we make sure that we adapt so that we can actually have a little more success in that direction? And the incremental successes are what lead you to that destination. It's not that you just automatically, you know, climb the mountain in a day. So it's, it's that understanding that we're going to have to have incremental successes. And that means that each time there's going to be some failure on the outside, but Anyways, that it's not learning from those mistakes that we make on the way to our destination, and and the other way is the is the is the biggest one to me is that 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 the fear of failure holds me back yeah. from attempting to give my best because I want to hold back something in order to explain why it didn't work if it doesn't work. So it's this safety net that we want to have that protects our ego from having to be confronted by the fact that we may not be good enough. And that's something that exists in all of us is to, that desire to, um, because we're social animals, we don't want to be thrown out of the, of the group. Mm -hmm. And so we, we try to do everything we can to maintain our status within the group. And that is not the same as being the, the real self. It's just a protective mechanism that we do during our, we develop it as kids, you know, and it's, 
It's this desire to position ourselves or to maintain our status within the group so that we don't get thrown out. And so we'll do a lot of things <clears throat> in order to avoid that happening. Um, but when we, when we, for instance, uh, try to protect ourselves and don't try to put in the extra effort to see how good we could be, we have this kind of a fail-safe device to protect ourselves. The problem is that over the long term, we don't grow. Um, we, we don't, um, we don't uh, step out of our comfort zone and therefore we don't evolve as people and, 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 and learn and create new things. And we have this feeling of like, uh, I'm stable, but I'm unhappy because I'm bored and I'm not growing. Yeah. And also the people I work with, the team, they start to recognize that I'm not pulling my weight. I'm not doing the extra. I'm not growing with them. You know, if we have an ambitious team and an organization that wants to grow and be the best they can be, uh, and I'm holding back for fear of failure, then eventually I'm going to actually succeed in accomplishing that, uh, that which I really want to avoid because the group is going to eventually throw me out. That's a good one. Yeah. We call it the negative self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. So um, it's, it's what I'm thinking about what you say, because I'm a, I'm a, a big gamer. And I play a lot of call of duty. <laughs> I know you're probably thinking, what, why, why is he starting with talking about gaming? But I like, I gaming. love it, man. I love it. And, and what you're just saying is what also, uh, a friend of mine said, I used to be so scared of running around in the, in the fear of getting shot and being in the fight because I wanted to make it to the end of the game. And then my friend also said, he's like, you're not going to learn anything because you're not engaging in any, in any fights. So you're not learning how to shoot, how to move, whatever. Yes, you're surviving till the end. But we're, like you said, all growing. We're getting shot a lot. <laughs> and we're growing and you're just sitting there. So at a certain point, we're going to kick you out because you're not good enough. And kind of value, I started yeah. running around, I got hammered all the time. But now you see all those gun fights actually improving. But like you said, it's that status. Like, I want to make it to the end, not get kicked out of the group. So I'm totally relating in a Call of Duty kind of way. Yeah, well, it's so true. It applies in all those situations where we're actually holding back because we have this... Um, we have this perception of the way other people perceive us. So it's our, you know, we, we look at others and we think, how do they think of me? And therefore I try to adapt who I am in order to try to serve them or, or stay in the group or make them accept me. Mm. When in fact, it's really um, just the opposite. It's just being yourself and allowing yourself to explore how good you could be. That's what really attracts people is this people that take risks, people that step out of their comfort zone, people that try something new, you know, and they persevere through it and they keep going. Those are the people we admire most in the world. You know, those are the, the Thomas Edison's or the people that have, you know, gone down in history. You know, he said famously, I know 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. I mean, how many of us have persevered to 10,000 attempts at anything? Yeah. But obviously he had this huge connection and, and desire to create sustainable light. And, and that really, held firm throughout all these horrible failures, which I can only imagine would be just, you know, at, at failure number 6,000, what are you doing? You know, you're like, okay, this is it. I'm done. I'm going to go, I'm going to go sell flowers or something. I don't know, but this is not working. That's but, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, the Winston Churchill said, what did he say? He said, uh, success is failure after failure without losing enthusiasm, mm -hmm. you know? So it's that idea. And that's what attracts us to people that have that, that, I don't know, you know, you know, you know, you're in a company of someone when they can just be themselves all the time and they're just not concerned about the reaction from outside. They they have a real good sense of who they are and what they're how they're trying to impact other people. Yeah. And so they go from a from a feeling of their values, their core values, you know, what they stand for, and they try to translate that into behaviors that impact constantly. You know, I call that the ripple effect. You know, it's it's when you walk in a room or when someone walks in the room, the dynamic changes for good or bad or, but it's, it's an impact. It's always an impact. Yeah. And so what's your impact? Because that's really one of the few things in our life we control is our, you know, our behavior, our, our the tasks and processes and our, our desire to get better and grow. And, and that's contagious. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a growth uh, contagion. And then same is true for fear. If I have a group of people that are afraid to risk, afraid to speak their mind because the, the environment is toxic for some reason and whatever, people are not allowed to fail or people are not allowed to 
you know, uh, speak their minds or somebody has an idea and, and, and it's put down very quickly. These are, these are environments where people are just constantly dealing with, just don't, you know, don't make a mistake. Yeah. Uh, and that eventually, you know, if you're playing a team that, 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 that's not afraid to fail and continues to push themselves and grow, just like you said, you get better and better. Well, when you end up playing those people or competing against them in the same industry, they're going to kick your butt. There you go. There you go. And it's, it's, so what I remember is we're talking about failure. It's not just failing for the failing, because like I said, on Instagram, they, they, they bombard you with, with just fail, 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 but you fail, you learn and you fail not to fail because you don't want to fail. The, the goal is not to fail as much because if you're not failing, you're doing great stuff. But if you do and you allow yourself, you learn from it, you get better and you got to step out there. So that's what remember what, what, uh, what you're saying. Uh, it also reminds me of, of you know, the documentary on Netflix with Elon Musk, the latest one where they're talking about SpaceX that they managed to land the rocket. Uh, yes, I saw that. Yes. It that was me of, of great example. And brings me to the second part of my question, like I said, uh, of what you just said is that he he said i don't want my rockets blowing up because it costs me a lot of money so if you say to me oh failure is good he said no failure is expensive so i want the first rocket to work that's that's the basic idea yeah and he said but there is room for failure that if the rocket explodes that's like you said they have the urge and the ability to not be hammered, but be like, okay, what can we do better? And hopefully the second rock right. can explode. And that's what about, and it brings me to my second question of part. I can now imagine that people listening are like, okay, I get it. So it's not failure for the failure. It's doing that learning, still going for the best, but stepping out of the comfort zone and not like me sitting in a corner, hoping I don't get shot uh, in my call of duty game. But then I can imagine that people say, well, Brian, that's, that's like you said, theory, easily said. And I imagine that people follow you and that you have an impact when you walk into the business room. But how do you do it? Because the moment people stop listening to this podcast and go back into business or go back to their family, whatever, it's back. Reputation protects myself, which is a very normal reaction. So how do you get that team, those people, like you said, leaders is about pushing people further to growth. How do you do that? Yeah, well, it's a great question. I mean, it, the idea is that you, you, you have to go through a process of understanding, you know, what, what are the kind of environments that I want to work in? What are the kind of environments that stimulate me in the past that I've experienced? Uh, you know, what kind of teams have I worked on in the past that I really enjoyed working on? Uh, what was the atmosphere? What kind of a vibe did we have? What kind of behaviors were actually in play there that made it so attractive for me? And then look at that and say, okay, well, how do I go about duplicating some kind of environment where people, and it comes down usually when you break it down into the common denominators, you know, it's about, it's about safety. Mm -hmm. It's, do I feel safe? Can I be myself? Can I express myself without being judged? I think that's one of the things that we really uh, tend to really uh, fail at <laughs> is that the desire to judge people so quickly because we, you know, when it works like this, uh, Mark, in any case, what, what happens is you, you, you observe something in your environment, you know, you see it or you hear it or, or use your other senses and you taste it or you feel it and you try to associate it to something that makes sense to you. And we want to because we want to understand the brain wants to understand what's going on. And, and so that, that happens really quick. I associate it to it. And then I have this kind of evaluation of, is it, is it a good experience? Is it a bad experience? Is it neutral? What is it doing to me? Um, and on what level is it hitting me? Is it a really a big emotional thing or is it a semi-emotional thing? Or is it like, you know, am I really angry? Am I slightly annoyed at something uh, by this behavior because I'm judging it as being something negative and therefore I start to behave in a way that's reactive to the way I associate. So I'm immediately making a judgment and that judgment causes me to behave. And this happens in milliseconds all the time. And so it's the ability to hold back on that quickly and just to say, wait a minute, what am I seeing? And um, what, what is it doing to me? What is it making? Why is it making me feel this way? You know, what, why do I feel this immediate uh, defensiveness when someone uh, asks me why I'm late? You know, uh, instead of just saying, well, I got, you know, the bridge opened up uh, and, and it's just, just the way it, it is. And I don't want to do that again. I'll make sure I, I don't keep coming late because that bridge is open. Yeah. But at the same time, it's this feeling that 
that I'm uh, that that I'm not in control, and the, the environment's kind of controlling me by the way it's behaving towards me, and I'm constantly reacting to these things that I'm associating to, it. rather than saying, "Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk in today and I'm gonna create an environment where people feel safe, where they feel recognized, where they feel appreciated, and that's gonna be my filter." So I'm going to filter on the good in people. I'm going to filter on the good in the situation. And I'm going to filter on my qualities as a person that can actually impact that environment. So what kind of qualities do you have as a person at your best that you can walk in a room and make sure that that environment feels appreciated, feels safe to talk, feels open, um, feels trusted, whatever those feelings are that you want trying to create. How do you go about doing that? And so it's understanding what is what are my what are my gifts, what are the qualities that I have, and how do I use those to impact an environment to make it feel the way I, I think it should. Yeah. And then when things happen, and and things do happen, you know, as I say, shit happens every day, that wants to knock you off course. Um, that's the moment where you really have to know who you are and what you're really trying to accomplish because when it's not happening that way, we're really at our best. Like right now I feel safe. I feel comfortable. We're having a great conversation and uh, I feel appreciated. That's great. Uh, but as soon as something happens in the environment, or maybe you say something that makes me feel less than that, I can either react to that or I can try to maintain my course yeah. and say, well, what would I do if, you know, my purpose, my mission was leading my behavior right now. And that's why I call it mission driven behavior. It's basically two components, right? It's like, what do I want to create in my environment and what am I prepared to give to make that happen? Yeah. And when things go wrong, how do I maintain that course? It's by understanding um, who I am at my best. And, and does it mean you're never going to go into your ego? You're never going to have, no, of course not. But for the shortest period of time, you try to do that to reposition yourself and get back on to being the best version of yourself. Yeah. I mean, if you were to all of a sudden say, you know, Brian, the only reason your team won the world championship is because your players were great. It wasn't you. Well, then there's, there's a, obviously my ego takes over and said, wait a minute. Uh, I got a little pride here. Uh, let me explain a little bit about what I did. Well, I'll scratch my next question then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's not, uh, but, but in the, in the past, I might've reacted with anger and, and then pushed back on you and say, well, who are you? You don't know baseball at all. What do you, you, you know, who, yeah. who the hell are you to judge me? Instead of maybe taking another angle and, and being curious about why you asked that question, what, what, what information do you have that makes you say that? Uh, why do you make that judgment on me? Um, and, and that puts the whole conversation into another area where it's, it's no longer as emotional, but it's more about the content and the context. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's more constructive. And, and that's maybe a harder question, but it, it, it triggered me while you're saying that because I hear two components of what you say. First, as a leader, create that safe environment, making sure, just like the podcast here, that I'm very happy to hear that you feel safe and that you want to share. So that's the leader's job to make sure that you feel that you can perform and that you can fail, like we talked about, and actually grow. But then on the other hand, I'm hearing a component of what, as an employee or a part of the team, or in, in, in your case, in the baseball team, you have your own responsibility of what is your mission? Who, who, what is your value and how am I entering? But even though there is a safe space, it could be that as a person, you still walk in, well, it's safe, but I'm still going to attack anyone who comes at me. So am I correct that it's both the leader and the other person? The reason I'm asking is also if you look at the world right now, there's a lot of talk about burnout. I had it myself writing a book about it. So was I. And it's, pun not intended, a hot topic. But where you're there all the time is it's the boss's fault. It's the leadership's fault that I am burning out and I'm not feeling happy. What I hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is yes, it's the leader to create the safe environment, but you have your own responsibility. Without a doubt. And I think we still haven't really defined uh, what the leader is uh, because to me, uh, we're talking about being yourself in, in a situation. And to me, leadership is how one individual impacts an environment. It, it, it's not about the position or the title yeah. uh, or your place in an organization that that gives you leverage that gives you opportunity it gives you power um but there's a great expression right i mean a power doesn't change you it just reveals who you are so it, it's what do you do with the power that you have but as every individual in a team has power to impact the room 
and, and to be there for each other and to give the best of themselves for each other. Yeah. And so leadership is, is each person's obligation, in my opinion, within a team to provide the best version of themselves in order for the team to prosper and to grow. And when that person's not getting that, it's up to the team and not necessarily just the leader to rally to that person and find out what they're, what, what, why that is. Yeah. Because usually it's, it's fear is, is guiding their behavior. And, what, and one key golden rule for behavior is you have to understand that behavior always has a reward. So if you understand the reward, then you can actually tackle the behavior because people behave in a certain way in order to avoid attention or avoid responsibility. And when we, when we talk about the boss being the reason for the burnout, it's a way of actually blaming the environment. And that is on the short term, gives us some relief because it's not our fault, but in the long term, it takes away a power for us to actually change anything because we're giving all the power away to the environment, to the boss or whoever we blame it on. And so blame cultures, as we call them, are very dangerous because in the end, we lose the power to change anything. And to be honest, if I'm the real boss and the, and the leader, yeah. and I come to somebody who doesn't want to accept any responsibility or accountability for things the way they're going, then my my, I guess my view is if you're not part of the problem, you're probably not part of the solution. So I'm going to have to go somewhere else and try to find someone who doesn't. And it's the same thing we just talked about. It becomes that negative self-fulfilling prophecy. By avoiding taking accountability, eventually the group throws you out because you're not part of the group because you don't ever take any accountability for the behaviors or things that go wrong. And in fact, if we can learn to just say, listen, I, I just made a mistake and wow, it's a whopper. And let me tell you about it. That's a great environment because then everybody learns from the guy and everybody feels safe again to say, you know what, we can make mistakes. It's obviously not the same ones, but man, I learned. And by sharing it with you guys, we collectively all learn together. So we're not making the same mistake three weeks from now by someone else. And this is, this is what teams really do. They, 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 they combine their diverse skills together to, to become far greater than the individual parts. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I want to say that there's so much in there the, with the power one. It reveals who you are. The thing that you're saying, leadership is actually just a person walking in the room, having impact on someone else. Absolutely. Just being seen is a big, powerful tool. And, and we don't have to, you know, we don't have to have these epiphanies every day and these huge successful achievements every day. It's these incremental moments with each other that we we observe each other we're consistent with our behavior towards each other we care about each other by just saying how you doing by actually taking genuine interest in someone's family or their background or really just appreciating someone's behavior in a situation and noticing them um it's very powerful it's very powerful and and when it's noticed people tend to behave that way more often so if somebody's recognizing me for being attentive and being kind and patient with someone, I'm much more likely to continue to do that when it's recognized than if it's not. Getting the reward, like you said. Yeah, it's a reward. And, but, but it has to be genuine. You know, It can't be something where oh, I've got to give three uh, compliments in the next hour or else yeah. uh, I'm not on target. You, know, that's... That's true. Then you have these people that just came from a workshop or a master class on leadership and then they walk around the office and people are like, oh. They yeah. had a master class again. Yeah. <laughs> it's good for testing it because it's a safe environment, but, but it still has to be genuine, right? It has to be genuine. And if it's perceived as not, then it has the complete opposite effect, of course. You know. And who's, who's like, everybody has their own responsibility, but like I said, they have a role to play. Everybody has a role in the team. I can also imagine the baseball team, soccer teams, or football, I should say, in Europe. I always get blamed if I say soccer, but it's actually football in Europe. Um, what has a role? How do you find that out who has the role i'm also asking because i used to work for pepsico huge corporations they have a lot of graduate programs uh, development programs and i was always trying to pinpoint the high potential who has leadership potential so everybody has a role to play how did you define or maybe it just grows i don't know who has the the, the right role and the reason i'm asking not making this question too long but you remember us talking about the, the book I'm a big fan of, The Captain Class, which links sports to uh, leadership and sports to business world and what they found out in the sports teams. And there they said often the star is looked at as the leader. Everybody's an impact, but the star, the Ronaldos and the Messis have leadership potential. 
some people say no it's it's the coaches like like jose Mourinho that are very known the coach is responsible they're the true leader and other people say no it's someone else within the team that is unseen how do these roles grow how do you know who's the leader are you as a coach where you're the leader at the baseball team or the co i don't know Yeah, again, again, it's, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's really not the position that, that, that really becomes a leader, although you would hopefully have someone in a position of leadership that is a good leader. Uh, it's not the same thing. So I think to me, um, you know, I always make the little uh, comparison. If you're, if you're a, a coach and you're taking over a team or, 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 or a manager taking over a team and, and you walk in the room and there's 30 people there, And you talk about your own philosophy of how, you know, you want people to grow and you want to have a mindset where people take on challenges and we're going to do this. And of course, I'm, I'm exaggerating some of the numbers, but you, you could have, uh, you could have, let's, let's do even numbers. You could have 24 people in the room and, and you're going to have eight people in that room that really didn't need that talk at all. They're already growth oriented. They already have a real good purpose in their lives. They already know what they really desire. Yeah. And they're working towards it. You have eight people that really are trying to take a shortcut. They're kind of just existing in there, trying to maybe get a paycheck, as we call it, or just trying to get through the day without being noticed and do their job. And then you have kind of eight people in the middle kind of looking both ways yeah. as to which way do I want to go. So for me, if you can be the manager or the leader to kind of get that group of people towards the other side that way, and try to emphasize that growth side, then you start to have this thing called the tipping point in a team. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, you know, Tuckman's rule, right? About forming teams, you know, it's forming, storming, norming, performing, adjourning. Oh. Have you heard that before? Okay. So there's a, there's a way of forming teams. So basically what happens is, Hey, we're going to make a team. We're going to play uh, foosball on Wednesday nights. Anybody want to play? And you've got a team of 20 guys, it's probably too many for a foosball team. <laughs> We'll go with it. We'll go. we'll go with it. Right. So, so, you know, that's, that's the team. So you're forming this team. There's a lot of different people, a lot of diversity, a lot of different perceptions of themselves and what foosball means to them. And then it's like, okay, I'm the coach and we're going to start to form a team by having some rules, some ways of working, some ways of behaving towards each other. This is how we're going to attack. This is how we're going to play. This is our strategy. This is our philosophy. And, And that's where the storming comes in because now we've got norms for uh, what does respect mean? We got norms for what does trust mean? We got norms for what does it mean to cooperate? And this is what we see. So and I might be digressing here there, but, but most teams or organizations start with these values and then they allow people to kind of interpret what they mean. Yeah. And that leads to all kinds of chaos because respect to me and you is completely different in certain positions. And this leads to a lot of miscommunication and, and, and strife and friction. So the idea is to really understand, guys, we got to get to really to the norm level. We got to understand what does it mean and what are the rules of behavior that actually give me evidence that I'm being respected? What are the rules of behavior that, that let me know I'm being trusted? Mm -hmm. It's something you should be able to film. So if I filmed my team and behaving towards each other and I walked away and said, wow, these guys really respect and trust each other. Yeah. What did I see? Right. What is happening that I'm seeing that allows me to make that call? And so that's where we want to get to. And that's where storming happens, because you got a lot of friction. You got a lot of disagreement about what it actually means. And if you can survive that, then you get into what we call the norming phase. So everybody now has an expectation of behavior. And now it becomes no longer a, a hierarchical thing, but more an internal thing of this is who we are. This is our identity. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. This is how we behave under stress. When things go wrong, we fall back on our culture and our culture is one of strength. And we respond, I got your back, whatever those sayings are, foxhole mentality. I don't know if you heard yeah. of that, yeah. that yeah. feeling of I got your back, you know, I won't fall asleep on you. Next man up, whatever those things are. It give you that goosebump feeling that yes, I got to rally behind my players, and then it, it then it raises the expectation of everybody because you don't want to let down your teammates because you understand that this is the expectation for everybody. It's not just for you, for everybody, and so to be an outlier to bust yourself out of that um, is is really difficult to do because the glue is the people, the team, and so when the new player walks in, certainly as a coach, you have an idea of the kind of player you want. Uh, he walks in and he looks left and right. And all of a sudden, two thirds of the team is behaving in a certain way. These guys are eventually going to leave. I don't think they usually adjust. 
but each guy in the team is going to go towards that percentage and, and, and creating a team is not something that's overnight, by the way, I don't want to give people the impression that you can just start this and (laughs) off you go. It's, it's a lot of perseverance, a lot of consistency of behavior, a lot of role modeling from the leaders in the team uh, that allow people to feel that, that that's what they want to be doing. And all of a sudden it becomes contagious. And, And eventually there's not really a need to really tell people how to behave from the top. It's actually inside the team and saying, this is the way we do it or not. And if somebody doesn't start to behave that way, it's usually the players in the team or the teammates yeah. that actually will address his behavior. If it's going well, that's the ultimate because it's no longer needed from the coach, but it's really the players themselves to say, listen, that's not acceptable because that's not leading us towards our collective ambition. Mm-hmm. We want to be the best that we can be at this. And that behavior is, is definitely uh, pulling us away from that. It's not leading us towards it. So you, you got under, you got to let us know what's going on. Are you okay? Yeah. And that's a big thing too. And it's not about judging that behavior. It's about understanding it because it gets back to that reward thing. Hey, what, what's your reward for this? Why are you doing this? You know, what makes you want to show up late three times in a week? What, what, what additional value are you adding through that? Are you okay? Is something going on at home. I mean, can we help you? You know, and that gives that person uh, hopefully that feeling that they can be honest and open and come out with that fear. Because unaddressed fear don't go away. And that's something I think a lot of teams do is they just they try to they try to minimize the the fear of someone else by saying, ah, it's okay, you'll be all right. You know, don't it's not a big deal. Don't don't be too afraid. You know, it's okay. Uh we'll we'll get it done. But but you really all you do then is just bury the fear and that person doesn't discuss it anymore with anybody. It becomes this passive aggressive behavior, you know. The manager goes, guys, we're going to cooperate more often. We're going to work together, right? It's going to make us better as a team. We're going to succeed more. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. But inside, there's these fears. You know, I worked on a team where I had a good idea. I gave that idea five years ago, and somebody stole it from me, right? I ended up uh, helping some people out, and I didn't hit my KPIs, and I didn't get my bonus. Whoa, I'm not doing that again. I get screwed for that. Why am I not? I'm not getting rewarded for cooperating. I get rewarded for hitting my own targets. This is what happens when, you know, personal goals are not in line with the teams. Um, People start to actually, uh, you know, look out for themselves possibly or go on their island. So this creates all this passive aggressive behavior. And three weeks later, the coach or the manager is going, why aren't we? We all said we were going to do it, but but we don't. Yeah. Because we never addressed the real fear. We never got it out in the open. People didn't do it. That's right. If I I look at myself, I always try, every time I listen to you, I'm trying to relate it to myself and, I recognize so much, like I have a big fear or yeah, it's, it's smaller now because I'm really stepping out of my comfort zone, but I'm not a big fan of everything that goes high and fast, like ski lifts and roller coasters and things like that. And if you're talking about it, addressing the fear and having that team that, like you said, a leader is just a person that has impact, preferably positive impact on, on someone else. And if I look at throughout the years with those fears, you have people around you that will say like the examples of the leaders or the managers you gave that will say, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. The ski lift. Don't worry. It's just going to be uh, fun with the best intentions. But in your head, you're thinking like, stop saying that it's not resonating with me because it's, it's still different. high up and it's still going fast, this roller coaster and going over, uh, over certain things. And then you have the other type of people saying um, that laugh away a bit your fear and it's like oh my god you're a grown man marnik and it's just a roller coaster you see that kid on there that kid has more 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 bravery than you then you completely block and then you don't have the safe environment so you don't want to go with them anymore right and then the third party uh these are also the people that i take to disneyland (laughs) because i need them uh the third party is they just listen every time you go into an attraction like the first time i did the tower of terror in 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 disneyland i'm also i always want to try so i don't want to say i'm gonna do it i'm gonna try they say, like, are you okay? Like you said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm shaking my boots. I had never been so afraid in my life, and we are not even in the attraction. And they said, that's that's perfectly fine. Is, is there something? And they start asking, like, is there something? What are you feeling right now? What what is your, what is your biggest fear? Right. And 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 they say, like, well, but what, what if it drops like that and it's in the dark and I can't see it? And they start talking about, well, the first time I had it, this and this happened. And you're still stressed. But as they're doing it, you're walking towards the Tower of Terror. And before you know it, you're sitting in there. You're doing it. It's only one or two minutes. 
you're doing it. You're still scared as hell. You end up and they're like applauding you and just saying, you did it. You don't have to do it again if you don't want you, but you did it. And those are the people that take you to every attraction in Disneyland. So that's how- Beautifully it's said, Marnix. Beautifully said. It's that curiosity that really is that makes the difference. I think it's one of the greatest qualities of any leader is being curious and not judging and being patient with people in those situations because you you can empathize with their fear and the, and you and you're patient about trying to explore you know what it is that they're really afraid of what's the what's the bottom line that could happen and uh, and then obviously asking them as well what you know well well that's okay and are you happy with the with the possibility that you will never do that is that something you can live with is that something you're okay with that you would never uh, have experienced that is that something that's okay and if it is that's fine too you don't have to be taking every risk in the world that you really don't want you have to have some reason you want to do it if you don't I'm not going to go skydiving i decided that i'm not going to exactly if you find yourself up in the plane and the exit so something went wrong in the journey on that way to got you up there that made you think wait a minute this is really something i don't and there's a lot of people that balk at the door from what i've heard but but i have no intention of getting in that plane anywhere close to that plane so that for me i i don't uh, I don't know why I would get all the way to that door. I probably would never get there. But, right. but yeah, it's about that that recognition of what is that fear and what's holding me back and what are the uh, what are the chances of that happening and also what's going to happen if I don't do it. What are the consequences of that? Uh, right. Is that going to lead me to be afraid of, of many other things? And, and and as you said with the with the skydiver, what is the reward for me to get yeah. playing? If there's no reward, I shouldn't be doing it. Shouldn't yeah. do it. And it's the second thing. Besides the fear example, because I really recognize that is what also resonates is, is what you said before that is the, the friction part. You have so many companies that are defining the values and their missions, and you have all these big talks and speeches, and you have it on the wall, and we have values, and you yeah. leave people up to interpretation. So I really love that, that you're saying that, that you're like, it, it's respect is different. I'm just repeating your words there. The respect is different for you and me. If you're leaving it up to chance or, or interpretation, it goes all over the place and you have probably subcultures. But I really loved the friction part that you should be able as a business to go through that and say, these are the rules, this is the behavior, and you're going to get pushback. And you're going to yeah. get people not recognizing themselves, and, and, but you have to have sit through it, like you said, and yeah. at the end be able to film it. That's, I think that should be like, I'm writing this all down. This is this is this is gold. You should be able, if you've done it right, you should be able to film the behavior that you. Uh, but how, how do you deal with that friction? How do you how do you go there? Because not a lot of businesses, I think, want to go to that friction part. Definitely in the war on talent uh, market we live right now. Yeah, well, I guess that it also becomes a self fulfilling prophecy as well. It's either pay me now or pay me later. I mean, if you look at the long term uh, negative effect of people that are deep, unmotivated that are not enthusiastic about what they do um that's an incremental bleeding that's the bleeding of a thousand cuts you know it just slowly bleeds your company to death because people are just not engaged they're not giving their best effort uh they don't have any real connection or mission in the in the in the in the uh in, in the in the workforce and so they're they're basically holding the level of the of the company down so there's going to be some you know, probably some real growth issues within the company and some real people that are probably going to want, not want to work there because of the atmosphere is toxic and, and there's no ambition in the group or there's just a lot of fear going on. And so when you think about recruiting the best people in a talent pool, people want to work for a company that gives them this feeling that they belong so that they have really powerful relationships with people that are meaningful. And that's, that's where I want to work. I also want to work in a place where my competency continues to go up so I get better. I can grow. I can learn. I can, I can, you know, explore my passions and my abilities within an organization. So I feel that I'm growing. There's a growth cycle, growth path. And, and I have autonomy. So I have this freedom. I'm not micromanaged. There's not somebody over my neck all the time. There's not somebody making me, you know, uh, telling me everything I got to do. Uh, but I have an environment where I have this freedom to succeed. And, uh, and if you have that, that's, that's, that's fantastic. So back to your point, if you're in an environment where nobody wants to tackle behaviors that are uh, counterproductive, 
and don't have anything to do with a collective ambition of the of the of the company, the vision of the company, um, then I think you're really making a big mistake because people are not going to re, uh, remain at that. Good, talented people will not remain there. They don't want to work in that kind of environment. They want to they want to work in the environment I just described. So retention and recruitment become a major issue. It's much better to face up to people and start a uh, have a, have a storming session, which could last a few months without a doubt, if not a year. Where people are actually, you know, uh, their behavior is is noticed. Now it's not about all saying, you know, hey, uh, you know, you, you threw your paper on the floor, you know, you do me fifty push-ups. Yeah. It's it's yeah. about it's about getting to people to understand that it's what they want to do, not what they have to do. So norms to me are things that we want to do. I want to be here. I want to acknowledge each other. I want to offer help. I, I feel comfortable asking for help. I want to do that because I know it helps us all. If we get into situations where I have to, I have to, I have to, that's fear. Is, that's a fear-driven situation because there's consequences if I don't. Yeah. So again, easier said than done. Uh, but finding those people, it, 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 there's going to be people in your organization. This is something I come across because in my game, basically everybody that's playing baseball loves the game. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, but there comes a point where some guys don't want to develop anymore. They don't want to put the time and the effort into it. Maybe they have a couple of kids and they're in a different life stage and it starts to starts to ebb in terms of their desire and their passion and so forth. So I have to find another talented person for that person. And I, and I probably can, and I can just tell that person they got to go. But if you got a guy that's working in the company for 30 years and he's, you know, he's as close to his pension, it's more challenging because there's obviously uh, some remuneration issues that have to be dealt with when you let go of somebody for 30 years. Uh, and that makes it more challenging for managers and bosses and organizations where you have these kinds of protections for people and in terms of letting them go. And you have to, you know, so uh, it is about trying to appeal to that person and trying on an individual basis to recognize them and find out what it is that kicks them. What gives you fulfillment? What do you enjoy your job? What do you, what do you love about this? And, and can I put you in that position more often? How can I help you to be there more often? Uh, and how can I convince you to use this great experience, wisdom, and knowledge that you have for the last 30 years in order to help other people grow? Yeah. Can I delegate some authority to you? Because I, I would love to have you working with some of our younger guys, for instance, uh, it could be an angle. But it's, it's, it's finding out what's driving each person on an individual basis and then using that collectively to, to understand you know, how can we make the most of this with each other? Uh, but there has to be some rules of behavior because that's what we fall back on, Marnix. When, when our strategy is great, but we have a lousy, toxic culture, then whenever stress happens and adversity happens, we're going to fall back on that culture. So it's either going to be a blame culture or, hey, don't, don't look at me. It's not my department thing or I'll go off my island and the hell with you guys. Yeah. Or it's going to be, hey, you know, rally the troops. Let's get behind each other. Next man up. Step in. How can I help? Let's go. Somebody's under fire, you know. I saw. I think it was. Was it uh, cynic? I saw recently on uh, on LinkedIn was talking about the sisterhood, the brotherhood yeah. focus of teams uh, and organizations. That it's really a family. We're allowed to bicker. We're allowed to argue with each other with respect and so forth. But but when it comes time to unite, man, we go for it, you know, and we and we we get it done outside there. That's what that's what teams do. I mean, we have our little arguments inside. We have our interpretations that need to be addressed we have to deal with that a lot but when the game starts man it's it's all of us unified against that that common goal opponent in our case we have a, an actual opponent on the field you don't always have that in a business realm but you still have competitors that you that you measure uh, and look at but it's, it's uh, i I agree, and that's that's of course, like you said, it's not always easy. In theory, it's easy, um, but in a company, you have diff different factors. But it's also a personal opinion. And maybe I'm too strong in that, but if I listen to this, it's you gotta have that culture because that's what you fall back to. You're that family. Yes, you can fight, but in the end, when it comes down to actually performing, everybody gets with it, and that's why I always say myself is indeed you got to have a program like you said you have rules you have norms you got to have a program these days we're very feared of rules and problem because everybody has to have their freedom and it's meant in a positive way and once you have the program you get you stick to the program you get with the program and that sounds really hard but i'm really convinced of that and also when i'm hearing you get with the program that doesn't mean that we're going to hammer you because that's not a safe environment but you see that yeah. often 
also with clients that we work that you have one or two people, like you said, sitting there maybe for a very long time or just got recruited. They're totally not into that culture, but they're defining the culture and you see the team team struggling. That's the moment you go like either, how are you doing? Are you okay? And can we change you to that? And if not, well, you're not getting with the program. Yeah, no, and you're going to have to go, I think, is it is essentially that that's what's got to happen. I mean, because you have to, as a as a manager, as a leader, you have to set the example. And, and if you start to tolerate or lower your expectations of how these people are actually behaving, then eventually what you happen is you have a very complacent comfort zone type culture where people are not going to do extra. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not about working extra hours. It's about giving your best when you're there. That's all we're asking for. It's not about because uh, some of these things that are misinterpreted is about, you know, all, all these executives and directors working their 60, 70 hour weeks. I don't think that's healthy in any, in anybody's definition of the term. So it's about within the time I'm here, how much can I be in the moment? And I think that's something we haven't talked about, but being in that moment, being in a place where you can actually focus on what's happening right here and not worried about what happened 10 minutes ago or what might happen 10 minutes from now, but right here, how can I impact this room? and make these people feel safe, but also make them feel enthusiastic about what we're trying to accomplish. Have I explained my vision? Is my vision clear to everybody? Do you understand where we're trying to go with the company? We're trying to grow. We're trying to become the best. We're pursuing excellence within what we do. So that means operational excellence. So if we have operational excellence, what does that mean to you? Another thing is to kind of look at, if you looked at your business, if you looked at your company as a person, what kind of person would it be? You know, I always like that. It's kind of like, what kind of, what kind of adjectives would describe this guy? Yeah. What would he look like? What would he act like? What, what kind of behaviors would you see from that guy if the company was a person? Mm-hmm. And cool. then you say, okay, so how do, we, how do we make that person come to life? What can we do to make that, uh, that guy radiate this type of feeling towards our stakeholders, towards those people that we involve with, our customers, you know? And do it for your customers, too. You could say, oh, what is our customer? Who, who is he? What is he like? What does he dislike? And how can we meet those needs and stuff? But it, it's when you make it personal, when you make it on the person level, it becomes very interesting because then it's like, okay, wait a minute. If that's who we are, if that's our character, if that's what that person looks and feels and smells and whatever like, uh, what is my contribution to that? Am I contributing to that? Am I making that greater? Am I making that better? Am I making us more? Or am I pulling away from that? Am I making us that guy look a little bit less of that person? So to me, all your behavior is basically in two directions. You're either trying to maintain your status and look at at ways to protect yourself, or you're contributing yourself in order to make the collective better. You're giving of yourself in order to grow, grow your environment, grow others. And by witnessing that growth, you get this great feeling that you matter, right? I see the growth. I know I'm making a difference because I'm giving the best of myself. I can see someone happier. I can see someone's skill acquisition getting higher. Damn. That makes me feel really good because I know I'm making a difference because I'm giving to that. I don't need you to tell me that. That's your ego needing a massage. That's your that's the outside world telling you how good or bad you are. Yeah. And if you allow the outside world to dictate your behavior, then eventually you won't grow because you'll be constantly trying to manage their expectation rather than your own. And that's dangerous in any circumstance. So who are you? What are you prepared to give this company or this team in order to make them great? Because without you at your best, that's one part of the machine that we don't have. And that doesn't mean you're in the room, but if you're not in the room, and, but you're not giving, you're not in the moment, then we don't have the best of you. And then we need to find out why that is. Because without that part, we're less <clears throat> as a whole than we were just a moment ago. So how do we get everybody given the best that they got? And that's creating this kind of culture where people understand what kind of norms we think are associated with the identity of this company, this team. Who the hell are we? And how do we behave to let everybody see that as evidence that that's who we are? You film us, you watch us go. We are freaking enthusiastic. We are passionate. We persevere when things go wrong. We have, we are curious about how do we get better? You know, these are things you can actually see people do. Um, We trust each other. We back each other up. We're next man up. All these things that we, so that's, that's why I, I love to just talk about it in those terms, you know, making it actual into a, the team, into an actual person, because yeah. the team is people in the end. So we're all unified behind 
what that person looks like, and we all start to behave that way, then the chances are really great that we're going to have that kind of impact that we want to have. It's that simple. If I go into a room and I know exactly what kind of environment I want to create, what I'm prepared to give to make that happen, I'm so much more likely to make that happen than if I go into the room after being in traffic for an hour and come in with a grumpy feeling of saying, hey, don't talk to me for the first 10 minutes, or I'm just going to check out, or uh, I don't really want to be here. Uh, and I'm going to make sure everybody kind of knows it by just not participating. You know, that's a choice. Uh, that's power on both sides. Yeah. And we tend to really throw away so much power by allowing this environment to tell us how we're supposed to behave <clears throat> on any given moment, yeah. rather than knowing, wait a minute, you know, this is who I am. This is what I can do. And no one can push the button and shut me off except me. Mm. And no one can make me angry unless I allow that. You know, no one can make me tired or frustrated. I mean, I can turn it on. And man, it's, I, I just, I love to see people that get that. When they get that, the, man, the, the, their, their potential goes through the roof because they now control the environment rather than the other way around. And it's like an epiphany, you know, it's that moment where you go, oh, Jesus, this is the aha moment of realizing that, you know what? I have a lot more power than I thought I did. Um, and it's that law of attraction, Mark, right? Because as soon as you start to do that, you start to receive it back, you know, because if you're open to me, I'm more likely to be open to you. If you close to me, I'll close to you. Egos activate egos and yeah. authentic behavior activates authenticity. People feel like they can, they can be themselves. And some people can do that really fast, have that ability to connect really quick. And, and those are the people we kind of admire. Other people take a little more time. And I understand that. And there's nuances to trust. You know, you got to build some kind of emotional capital with people to get to that layer where people feel more vulnerable and are willing to share their intimacy with you. Yeah. Um, but your mission's the same to get to a point where people feel that they can be intimate, they can be vulnerable. And how do you do that? By being vulnerable and intimate with them. Uh, <laughs> there's no other way. But, hey, tell me your secrets, but I'm not really going to tell you mine. Oh, yeah, that, that's not going to work, dude. So it's the role modeling of a leader. And that's something as well. You see a lot of leaders are afraid to say they don't know. You know, they have the imposter syndrome. You know, they have this feeling that they're going to find out that I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not as good as I, I am. And maybe I don't deserve to be in this position. And that, that keeps them in this fear zone where they either bully people and tell them to do it because I told you. Or, or they, they, they tend to be indecisive and can't make a decision or whatever those uh, barriers that they face, it's, it's through the inability to just say, hey, I'm a human being, I need some help, that's why I have a team, because if I'm the smartest guy in the room all the time, then I need to be in a different room, or I need to invite some more people into this one, because that's not a healthy environment, so why am I not taking advantage of the power of my team by telling them, guys, I need your help, tell me the best ideas. And by doing that, I mean, you activate everybody's brain because now we're all saying, hey, man, I'm seen, I'm appreciated, I'm heard. I got some ideas that are being taken serious. It doesn't mean I have to take every idea, but I'm listening to your ideas. And that, to me, is a great leader as well. It's one that activates everybody's skill set in the team. Uh, you know, Baseball is a great sport for that because we have like, we have guys that are like, you know, one meter 50 and we have guys that are two meters 20, you know, it's just some freaky guys, some huge size and different positions have different skill sets. And some are more defensive oriented, much more offensive oriented in areas. Some guys can hit balls, you know, 150 meters. Other guys can't hit it very far at all, but they make contact more often. And so how do we put all those little differences and, and, you know, unique skills and, and those diversities and unify them, as I said earlier, behind this, this collective desire to win this game. How do we do that? Yeah. And that makes the, the ingredients to the pasta, you know, it's like, how do we add a little oregano and a little bit of spice here and make this thing a little bit more. And we're constantly looking at that recipe. How can we make it a little tastier every day, guys? The moment someone says we're going to add mayonnaise to pasta, you're like, whoa, that's yeah. not the program. No mayonnaise. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Guys, we're not, we're not going to do the mayonnaise pasta on this team. You know, you might do that somewhere else, but you got to start another team, but we, we, st we stick with the tomatoes. <laughs> that's, yeah. It's really, everything you said is, it's, it's really, this is gold, man. I'm just, just getting all the, I should have, collect all the quotes out of, of, of what we're saying, but to, to sum it up a bit, what I remember of, of, of what you just said is everybody's talking about culture and different cultures. What I hear you saying, I also heard you saying 
uh, during the speech. There are actually two types of cultures. Like you say, blame culture, grow culture. That's it. You're either in one. Well, I say fear, fear and growth. Yes, yeah, fear. Yeah, yeah. because blame is a face. It's, it's, there's, there's a complacency culture. There's all kinds of subcultures, but fear is the real, the, the, the real reason. And then you got to see where you're at right there. And then on the other hand, also recognize what you're saying with, with the energy. People copy energy, feed of energy. You, like you said, everybody has that power. Do you give yourself that power? And are you willing to, like I said, not being the smartest person in the room as a leader or as a person that wants to have the power and the impact? And I'll notice myself when I gave my first workshop six years ago when I started this company, I had that whole, like everybody still do, Imposter syndrome, a lot of people have it, uh, but I wanted to be perfect. I was the person that was talking about communication, storytelling, speaking. So if I was standing in a boot camp workshop, in my mind, everything had to be perfect. And I was the one who was going to teach you the best intentions and show you, I'm going to show you how to speak. And it put so much pressure on me because I couldn't make mistakes because if I made a mistake, I would... I would not be doing what I was saying, not practicing what I preached. And I noticed in sessions, even though people were enthusiastic, people challenged me a lot and they got sometimes frustrated and they went, I couldn't pinpoint. It was like, I'm giving you all this knowledge. And then I noticed what you just said, that they're not waiting for me to have all the answers. Yes, they need to believe me that I know what I'm talking about or your credibility is gone. But the moment I, I realized that, by conversations with my wife, Natalie was also saying like, you're trying to be the strongest person, smartest person in the room. And I just shared, this is what I bumped into at PepsiCo. And this is what I learned. And this is what I'm doing right now with clients. Sometimes it works and sometimes it's not. And I showed that vulnerability of, mm. I might be better at something than most people than that's my profession, but I bump into a lot of things still. And then I noticed the group, all the groups now warm up. Like, yeah, yeah, that's what I also have. And you conquered that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they started giving me input. Like, maybe you can also try that. And you're good at that. Maybe you should do, do that just a bit more. And I started talking less. They started talking more. And in the beginning, I thought, if I'm not talking, you're not happy because you're paying for right. this. Right. And now you have workshops where they talk for 20 minutes. I don't say a word. And they go home and they're like, best workshop ever. And I'm like, I yeah. words. And that's yeah. resonated so hard with what you just said. Yeah, you're tapping into their potential. And they feel that. And they're allowed to explore that by, by speaking. You, may, you create the environment where people can actually have that discussion by showing your vulnerability. You engage them to help. And that's really kind of human nature to want to support someone that uh, is vulnerable in that situation, to be there for them. And then you feel that feeling that you matter, yeah. right? Because that's existential in us. If we don't have that, that's, that's the worst thing is when you don't feel you matter, when you don't feel you're making a difference. And by engaging people like you did, you give them that sense that, wow, I, I can actually help this guy. Uh, and then you can see, you go, hey, great idea. And you can just, that's all you need is to feel that, hey, wow, uh, recognition. I see that, that that helped him. There's a growth moment. Uh, yeah. that's, that's authenticity leadership wise. That's why I think it's so powerful what you just said. And, and again, re resonating to what you said in the beginning with the failure, getting there, oh, a lot of bad surveys. My friend, <laughs> it, it takes getting hammered and that you're so frustrated. And ego is like, I gave the best I had for a whole day. And now you're saying, but yeah, now it makes sense. Yeah. And I, you know, uh, ideally, and, and then this is the journey we're all taking. Ideally, you get to a point where you're not, your mood is not affected by the number of likes you get. And that's really a challenge because we're into a generation of people that are all about social media and it's all about thumbs up and likes. And I find myself just as guilty as the other. When I post something, I'm always kind of looking at, and I get reminded every day because my phone activates and tells me, hey, you got another response. You know, you're like, oh, let me, you know, it's that quick trigger. I need that marshmallow right now. You know, I need that, that, that instant fix of being liked feels good. You know, it's that dopamine fix. We get that instant gratification moment and we're, we're off. Um, but the real, the real joy comes in, in knowing, knowing that all I'm doing is posting out there in an effort to make other companies aware of other companies or aware of what they do and how great they are. And that's cool because I really like to do that. And that's my growth. And so if I can affect that, it becomes this ripple effect that I may not even see mm. the impact of that. I probably won't, you know, the impact is, uh, but I know I'm giving the best of myself in order to do that. And that's enough. Yeah. And if I get a thousand likes, that feels great. Uh, but I already know I'm doing what I want to do. 
So I don't really need the outside world to tell me that that's good mm -hmm. or not. Yeah. Because and and when you're trying to create an environment where people feel safe and enriched and and can reach their potential, uh, you got to understand that it it doesn't happen overnight, and you're going to have some setbacks, and you're going to have some things go wrong, and you're going to have some bad reviews, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's got to engage you rather than than make you crawl into your comfort zone again. It's got to be like, what happened? How come he didn't like that? What was going on? I'm curious. Why, why did he give me that bad review? Let me get in touch with this guy. What's going on? How are you? Not in an angry way, but a curious way, right? Because that's my mission, isn't it? If I'm really serious, I should be trying to reach this guy and find out why he's interpreting this way, that way. What's his perception of this? What is it that I can do? And maybe I'll never convince him, but at the same point, I'm, my whole mission is about that curiosity about what, how can I make this guy see the world in a better way? Maybe I can take that negative filter off his eyes a little bit, help him out. Yeah. Um, All right. We're almost out of time, Brian. I could talk like this for ages. I, like I said, not just to, to please you because you're here, because I, I'm going to make a quote book of insights of this podcast. I'm going to re-listen it myself and then just, just pure a blog out of it because there's so much value in what I just, and also different perceptions because I've been talking about leadership with a lot of people and now some things are really, I really need to relook the way I'm looking at leadership. Like you said, like I'm always looking at that one person that should be the leader. Like you said, can be the whole team. You're just the one facilitating it, all that kind of stuff. Last thing, question, a bit to sum it up. Let's say I'm listening to this podcast. Let's say, which people are, I'm convinced of it. Are like, okay, I heard so much good stuff that I can use in my business that I can rethink the way I'm thinking, how I work with a team, go with the friction. Am I in a fear culture, growth culture, all these things. But let's imagine I'm a person that is active in business. I just got my own team as a young leader, or I'm already a bit experienced, but I have my team. It's, it's growing in numbers. What would you be your recommendation to start after this podcast to, to, to facilitate everything that we talked about? Because like you, we're also in baseball. Then they say, here's the Dutch team. This is now your coach. Meet Brian. Do your thing. How do you start building what you build with the baseball team in business? As a, as a, as a, a team manager or just as an individual, any individual, is that what you're saying? Or yeah, as, a, as a, let's say I'm a, I'm a team manager. I'm a, I'm a young potential that just got their first three, four employees, or maybe you're already experienced. If I want to do what you just said, create that culture, get that team going and get that peak performance that you also achieved with your teams. How do I start after this podcast? What is my first move or your recommendation? Well, I think you just named it yourself. Is that understanding what is it you want to do with that team, right? What is, what is it you want to create with that team? What would, what would ideally look uh, would that team look like to you if they were functioning as a high-performing team? What is that? What, what would you be seeing? Because that's the environment you're trying to create. And once you understand what that looks like and feels like it smells like and tastes like, whatever you want to do, Use your senses all around it to say, wow, that would be the atmosphere I want to have around me. Then you have to start thinking about, okay, so what, what one step can I take today? One action that's going to start to move us in that direction because it's going to be an incremental thing and it's going to be a matter of consistency over time. So understanding your own gifts as a person um, at your best, what do you bring that helps that to begin to become a reality or possibility. You know what I mean? It's, it's that it's, it, if that's the mountain, what's the first step you got to take. And then once you take that action, be aware of the impact that action is having on the environment. Is it actually impacting the environment in a way that's bringing you closer to the place you want to be? And if not, then do something else. Right. And have that ability because that's where a lot of us fail. We just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And we can't, can't understand why the outside world doesn't get it. Right. Oh, you guys are dumb or something. What's wrong with you? Don't you understand what I'm trying to do? No, it's the other way around. It's about going, wait a minute. If I'm taking this action, it's not impacting to that desired outcome. Then I got to look at it and say, try something else because I'm not going to give up on that. Am I? Mm -hmm. Which is something else we do. We see the barrier and the barrier becomes more, more important to us not to look stupid or, or to struggle or to be uncertain of an outcome. So we give up and we create this narrative around why it can't be done. When then another guy steps into the same job and, and within a few weeks he does something else and all of a sudden he starts to see an impact. 
Um, so it's that ability to, 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 first of all, to take action is scary. It takes courage to step out of your comfort zone. So that courage in itself has got to be there. You step out, you take that action, you witness the impact of your behavior on the environment, and you decide whether it's continuing to have an impact, continue to do it, maybe add something out later. But if it's not having some impact, then change it and do something else. But don't give up on that, that beautiful dream that you have of creating an environment where everybody feels fulfilled and happy and safe. Yeah, so remember, where do you want to go? Know that up front as a leader, because if you don't know, they will not know. Take that first step, even though it's scary. Use the skill set, the, the backpack that you have on to impact it. If it works, great, keep doing it. If not, Correct. Check the game, learn from it. Okay, and then get going. And then do all the things, of course, that we've been talking about for ages. That's a good one. Yeah, I think a lot of leaders forget that. Me, myself. Also, like, where do I want to go? You have to figure that out yourself before you can take a whole group. Yeah, and then, you know, it depends on the target group you're talking about. I mean, you could have a, a different mission for different... Uh, I mean, you could have a mission for your work uh, and you could have a mission for your home. Uh, for your family and things and your friends and so forth. But it, usually it's very similar because it's, it's really understanding you. Uh, and you know, what can really help a lot of times is, uh, is, is just um, get together with your team and, and do a session where you kind of, once you get to know each other a little bit, um, just take a walk with each other and, and just describe to each other what it is you admire about each other. You know, what, what is it about you in the, in the, uh, in, in this team that I really appreciate? Yeah. Um, we don't, we don't do that. We don't sit still and actually sh share our opinions in a, in a way with each other, um, about what, what a difference you make in this team. And I mean, you're not here, what we miss, that really helps you to really kind of focus on, geez, I do have those qualities. Let me do them more often. And if everybody's doing that, then it's a real big difference. And also give you a tip, you know, I'd like to see you maybe you know, speak your mind more often in the group or, or represent your ideas uh, more often because they're great ideas, but sometimes you withdraw maybe, at least that's my perception. It's not, it's not the truth, it's my, my truth. Mm -hmm. But that helps people um, because we're constantly looking at, hey, how good are we right now? Let's celebrate that fact that I'm great, I'm, I'm okay, I'm good. Um, but what do I yearn to create? What do I desire to get better at? And what can I do? And what, what do you see in me that... that, that uh, that maybe I don't see myself that would allow me to take one more step. And what's that action? What would that be? Usually when you have this conversation with a group of 10 people and you get nine feedbacks like that, there's usually a common denominator, or the red thread as you call it. But the, the common denominator, usually it's a very similar because it's amazing how people see the same thing. And then you go, wow, I need to do a little bit more of that. Yeah. Um, and so we're growing each other. And we're also rewarding each other for the behavior that we see. And that helps us to kind of structure our behavior around what we really do that makes people feel good. Okay, cool. Linking to that and wrapping it up, last last question and also to what you're saying, because it, it creates beautiful moments if people are able to share what you just said with each other and are open to it and their ego is not bruised. So my last question and everything we said looking back on what you achieved, what you did in baseball. And, and, and as we said in the beginning, sports speaks to our imaginations. Heroes are formed in sports, even though they're also in business, but because it's on TV and, and, and it, it uh, speaks to us. What is one of the, and I'm probably putting you on the spot a bit, but what, what is one of your most memorable moments when we're talking about leadership peak performance excellence that you think that always stuck with me could be in in in, in, in world championship or before that you're like wow that's an anecdote that will always stick with me because it was so beautiful for what reason like i said putting you on the spot so i expect yeah. you to flip one out but i'm just curious uh, i wish i could i wish i'd had one right there ready for you but i i don't i'm gonna have to really kind of reflect a little bit on that uh oof I think it's, I, I don't know if I have a single one. I should have one because I've experienced so many moments in my life where I've seen people behave in a way that I thought was just so impressive. Um, ah, God, I'm struggling with it. <laughs> you, you thought, oh, it's got all going to be easy questions on this. Yeah, it was <laughs> going really good. And you had to end with this one, right? I really am dropping the ball right here. I feel horrible. No. But I think it's, it's certain behaviors that trigger me that make me emotional. Uh, that, that show that leadership. It's the person that kind of 
um, that kind of gives up their own personal need for someone else, someone who just like, you know, uh, you see all these, these moments where people stop to help a stranger or, or, or just uh, see someone fall and get up and they don't even really know them, but they go and they, they, they help that person get back up. I've seen moments in sports where you know, a person doing a marathon, they cramped up at the end and this guy stops his own race just to help this person get across the line. It's these moments of giving yeah. um, and, and without any, any reason to get anything back, not a transactional thing, but an idea of just giving to that person so that they can actually experience a moment of growth or a moment of happiness and fulfillment. So those, those kind of things, those are the ones that, that really bring tears to my eyes. And also those people that have been told over and over that they weren't good enough, that they couldn't make it, that they couldn't do it. And then they kept going on their own personal belief in themselves. Um, those people really radiate to me as great leaders because they understand the concept of believing in what you can do in your own potential and, and not letting anything take you offline in terms of doing that. And that becomes its own um, contagiousness with others. So as soon as you see someone continue to persevere, to continue to believe in themselves. I saw this American underdog movie yesterday about a guy named Kurt Warner, who for most people listening will not know who that is, but he's a famous quarterback in America. And he was not selected by any team initially. He's played for a small school. Everybody said he was never good enough, and he kept going and kept persevering and kept going. Eventually, he became a quarterback in the in the National Football League in America. Went on to become the first uh, person to ever win a Super Bowl. Was the MVP of the Super Bowl. Was the MVP of the season in one year, and went to the Hall of Fame. Uh, so I have such great admiration for people that that persevere under duress from the environment that people say they can't and they keep going. So I guess those would be some examples, but not the- a specific. And it's the perfect wrap up. It's the perfect wrap up because you made time for me in your busy schedule. And it's even a, a holiday to do this podcast. You were totally in the moment for one hour, one hour, hour and a half. I think we talked mm-hmm. totally in the moment. You gave me a moment of growth because I learned a lot. And I'm not just saying that to please you. And I think also the listeners are going to learn a lot from this, this podcast. And even though I put you on the spot with the last question, you're like, oh my God, I can't think of something. You persevered and you were like, <laughs> I'm still going to give an answer. And you came up with this and it was a beautiful ending. So you just wrapped it up all together. Uh, thank Brian, you thank you so much for the time. Uh, really looking forward. Like I said, I'm going to re-listen this podcast myself just to take uh, take the notes. What's next for you? What are you going to do this, uh, this, this weekend? Because it's a longer weekend in Belgium and the Netherlands. Any special plans? Well, my son came home this week, as you saw earlier, uh, before we went live, but uh, he, he came home from school. He was going to school in, in Missouri and he came home and he's got a baseball game this afternoon and this weekend. So I'm really looking forward to seeing my son play. It's been nine months since I've been able to see him play baseball. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. So uh, we're going to be back on the ball field this weekend, my friend. It's all coming together. So enjoy the baseball, the thing Thank you. That, that brought you to all these, uh, all these insights. Uh, and let's speak soon for everybody listening i hope you enjoyed it let us know linkedin youtube you know where you you can find it Um, i'll put all the contact details to brian farley you gotta have him at your conference i saw him speak my heart was racing pumping you also heard in the podcast i was really getting excited so get him in your business conferences talk to him if you want to start doing this with your team and creating that both culture there's so much uh that 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 he can can teach us brian thank you so much i'll connect people with you but for now enjoy the weekend enjoy baseball and thank you all for thank you marnix you're a true leader yourself my friend thank you cheers all the best are you listening damn